So um, when I created NPR's Planet Money, I, was, I grew up in all artist housing in Greenwich Village, New York in the 70s. So I grew up in a world where no one cared about anything to do with finance or economics. <laughs> um, they found the whole subject incredibly boring and also incredibly evil. <coughs> and I would sometimes joke, how can it be evil and boring? Like evil's <laughs> kind of interesting at least. <laughs> and so it's hard to rebel when you grow up in a radical world, so I rebelled by <laughs> learning about economics and finance and um, deciding I'm gonna explain why economics and finance can be interesting. Um, sometimes evil, sometimes not so evil. And there was a moment, and so I created Planet Money, for those of you who know it, as a team designed to make economic news accessible to people, interesting to people, without dumbing it down, without making it simplistic, and as we'll get into this conversation, I think that is crucial. There's a moment where a bunch of us on the team were sitting around and saying, why the hell did it have to be interest rates are the single most important thing in the world? Like, why did the most boring thing in the world have to be the most important thing in the world? So I do think that assuming every one of you has things you want to be different in the future, you, you think that there should be different trade-offs or different ways of thinking about what we do now and how what we do now connects with what the future might be like. Um, that is interest rates. That is how our system assesses the trade-offs between now and the future. And when I say the word our system, you might think, oh, is that capitalism? Yes, it's also socialism, it's also communism, it's, it, it's also pre-monetary barter systems that inherently, as human beings who can plan, we have to make con con constant trade-offs between things we're gonna do right now, resources we're gonna use right now, including the resource of our own time, our own effort, our own energy, and what we expect in the future. And I think I could argue that every single thing you are here to try and change involves some kind of trade-off. You are hoping that more people will make different choices today based on what they think the future holds. Or maybe they'll think about the future differently based on what today holds. And at base, when you hear them talk about the Federal Reserve raised the Fed funds rate by 25 basis points. That's what they're talking about. Um, when you look at your credit card and you're like, wait, it was 14.6 <laughs> last month, now it's 15.8. That's what we're talking about. It's how our system turns that idea into a number and a number that controls a lot of your behavior. It has a huge impact on where you live, how you live, where you work, how you work. Um, so in my view, whatever you're doing, whatever you're planning, whatever, whether that's an activist mission to change the world or it's a personal goal, if you're not at some level aware of the interest rates involved, <laughs> you're not really dealing with the thing you think you're dealing with. Well, obviously, <laughs> um, <laughs> look, they're boring for a reason. They're boring because it's good for people, some people, that they're boring. They're, it's good to make finance in general a complex technical topic. You know, finance is complicated. I've spent decades studying finance. It is complicated. And you can go deeper and deeper, and there's complex math, and, um, and, and finance isn't one thing. There's, you know, you could spend your whole life just studying one kind of bond, or one kind of stock, or one kind of other financial instrument. So I, I'm not saying everybody needs to become an expert, but the basic stuff, the basic ideas are you can learn in a weekend. You could learn in, in, a, in, a, in a few hours. And um, 
there, there's a debate within economics about why people don't engage this stuff. Um, you know, you can imagine if you went to an alien planet and you're trying to figure out what's going on and you want to succeed in this alien planet, you'd be like, well, just explain to me the system. What's going on here? Um, this is our system. This is the system you live in. And, um, and so the more you feel or sense or know mastery over this topic, the more um, options you're going to have in your life. It doesn't mean you have to suddenly become an investment banker. Um, it means whatever you want to do, you're going to have more mastery over. Um, but sexy is a little tough. It's a little tough. Because at the end of the day, it's about the stuff we don't want to think about. It's about choosing to eat certain foods and not eat other foods, even though you're craving the other food. It's about really looking at the trade-off. I want every building in America to be made out of sustainable materials, but a lot of the people involved in deciding what materials are not, don't share my view. So how am I going to intervene? How am I going to make them change? So interest rates really are about the boring stuff. I mean, what's more, who wants to think about trade-offs? Does anyone here want to think about trade-offs? Trade-offs suck. Like, you want the thing you want. You don't want the thing you don't want. And so I think it is inherent that part of the work of being a person motivated to change the world is not just imagining all the good stuff or focusing on all the happy outcomes if everyone happened to agree with you. It's really looking at those fundamental trade-offs. And the most fundamental trade-off is how we make decisions today and how those are connected to options in the future. It's obvious with climate change, but it's just as but it's just as well, you know. I ate too much food last night. I had a couple friends over. I drank too much wine last night. It's affecting me today. <laughs> you know, these are decisions we're making all the time. And if you have a conceptual set of tools to think about it, it's not going to be sexy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know that I can make it sexy. Any sexier than this? All right. <laughs>
there's, I could argue against its creation. It, it's on balance pro-rich and anti-poor. It's on balance um, over, made our economy over dependent on housing, which caused some problems, as you may remember. But let's just, for the sake of argument, say we like that it exists. Um, <laughs> that was a government program. And, and in, in the technical language of economics, what they did was they took what we would call externalities, meaning things that are not in the market transaction. So the, the belief that more people should own homes, the belief that there should be more stability in those homes, that people aren't <laughs> going to have to move every few years and change their jobs. There's a bunch of other factors that the government put into the interest rates and actually created a product. So you could imagine a similar thought process that goes into, say, sustainable building. You could imagine a 100-year mortgage. That's an idea that um, KP could talk to you about. Um, you could imagine a, you know, mo most commercial projects, it's a 10-year payback. And it's a purely market transaction. It's not government intervention in any way. And so in 10 years, you really need the, you need every square foot of that shopping mall or whatever to be earning money. So you're not, if you go up and say, oh, by the way, I want that to be sustainable. I want you to use good materials. And I want you to think about the workforce. And I want it to be equitable. You're, they're like, Screw you, I got 10 years to make all my money. I'm not going to think about any of that. So what if we had a 100-year mortgage? Or what if we um, used other variables to incentivize the right um, behavior? That, that is very doable. We do do it. Um, we do it in some ways in a bad way. We do it to subsidize the oil and gas industry. We do it um, to subsidize commodity agriculture. Um, so we have lots of sectors of our economy where we intervene in this process, this now and the future process, um, more often than not to benefit the wealthy. I'd say one of the reasons we do that is because they know the rules. They write the rules. They uh, have finance experts who are going to Congress and working with them to rewrite the rules in their interest. If I can, to the extent there's a side that we're all on, we. We have some of them. There's some really smart lobbyists in DC who are um, focused on sustainability or more thoughtful agriculture practices, but it's way outmanned or outpersoned. It's like, you know, I, I don't know if it's 1,000 to 1, 10,000 to 1, but it's, it, it, is not, it is not a fair fight. So I would say um, having more of us in this fight is one of the great ways to change the system. The default state of the current system is for people with capital <clears throat> to want to write the rules and manage the system so that they get more capital. It's very simple. Um, and uh, you, you really see this in very poor countries that don't have any kind of um, product. Like, I, I've spent a lot of time in Haiti. I've spent a lot of time in Iraq. Um, Iraq, for example, its mortgages were designed, they, you had to pay 50% of the price of the property. And basically what you had in Iraq is what you have in a lot of poor countries and a lot of the world before modern finance is um, essentially only people with capital got capital. And, um, and so it was much, much, it's much better in Iraq to be the idiot kid of a rich person or the idiot nephew of a rich person than to be a brilliant poor person. Because <laughs> the idiot kid is going to get money for his new business, is going to get money to go to school. They're going to get those things. Um, so one thing we should do is, like, there's actually a lot in our financial system that is amazing and wonderful. And we have a lot from, from that, probably if you thought it through, your job, your house, how you met your spouse, what, how you think about your kid's future um, is all tied into programs that, that are more pro middle class, let's say. Doesn't mean our system's fabulous. But the big roadblocks, I would say, are the things I said, that the people fundamentally writing the rules are, are the tiny percent who benefit the most um, from the way the system is at present, and we got to be in that fight. <laughs> Thank you.
so my least favorite comment that I have heard at Sea Change and heard it all over the place is, well, so-and-so needs to be less greedy. The financial crisis was caused by greed. The problem is greed. I'm not here to say the problem isn't greed, <laughs> but I am here to say that saying that is the same as saying I don't have any ideas. Um, I don't think that in <laughs> 2006, people on Wall Street were this greedy, and then in 2008, they suddenly became this greedy, and then in 2009, they became this greedy. <laughs> they were always greedy. They were always greedy. The financial crisis was not caused by their greed, by a sudden increase in greed or decrease in greed. Um, similarly, you're all greedy. You all want stuff. And you want stuff that someone else thinks you shouldn't want, whatever that is. <laughs> and um, so we do have a system built on greed. If you read your Adam Smith, and it's a great read, and I'm telling you, if you read Adam Smith, that guy was smart. That guy <laughs> solved a lot of the problems. Um, a lot of our system is not Adam Smith capitalism. It's, it's perversions of Adam Smith capitalism. It's a machinery to harness greed. And one of the ways to harness greed is to think about interest rates. If I want a developer to think long term, I could lecture him a lot. I could invite him to a conference he's not going to attend in Burlington, Vermont. There's a lot of moves I could make. But if I just change some interest rates dynamics, that's going to get him to think long term. That's, I would argue, maybe the only way to get him to think long term. So um, it drives me crazy when people blame greed or think of some as greed as some force out there that we're not implicated in and, if, and that there's some magic button, someone somewhere is gonna read a book by Bill McKibben and then everything's great. <laughs> Bill's great, I like Bill, but he's written a lot of books. People are still greedy. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Including Bill McKibben yeah, and me. Exactly. Amen. <laughs>
we live in a system. It has rules. It has policies. It has people who create those rules and set those policies. Um, it happens in serious meetings with, you know, math. There's spreadsheets involved, and um, and those are the levers. Eventually, and eventually, you have to be in a room with a bunch of people you don't like talking about a bunch of stuff that doesn't interest you that much, and coming up with compromises. And I do think that. It doesn't mean you have to only do that or all of you have to instantly become you know, finance experts. But if you don't have that as a key part of your theory of change, which maybe means just understanding it more, learning a little bit more about it. It may mean um, finding the people in your community who are doing that work and supporting them more. Um, it may mean looking inside and having a bit of modesty about why, hey, everyone I hang out with agrees with me, everyone else should agree with me, and realizing, okay, there are other ways of making decisions, there are other perspectives. So I think today in this crowd, if I was in a different crowd, I'd say different things. I would say, look inside yourself and think, what is my theory of change? And what are the spots, in, what are the decision points in that theory that I'm really not paying attention to because I find them kind of boring and lame. And maybe figure out how to either go there or at least support the people who go there.